Hi, my name is Dr. Amir Marashi. They know me as the Vagina Whisperer. I do cosmetic gynecology and endometriosis treatment. My main focus is to make orgasms better for men and women. And I'm trying different modalities to just, you know, put your sex life on a different level. One of the things that I saw on your Instagram was a post about this. So can you, what's an immature orgasm? (laughs) <laughs> There's no immature orgasms. All <laughs> orgasms are really mature, but unfortunately, that's what you know Freud did, and he kind of uh, stopped the clitoral orgasms for almost uh, a century. He said the only orgasms that are mature and real orgasms are vaginal orgasms, and that's completely wrong. And as We learn about clitoral anatomy, which unfortunately they didn't teach us because you know what clitoral anatomy was actually a part of Gray's anatomy book back in the day in 1900. And then after the stuff Freud said, it was completely pulled off. Yeah. Cause then I saw that on your page as well too. Like you guys weren't taught really about the clitoris in med school. Is that correct? Nobody's taught about clitoris in med school, in residency. I mean, the only thing you know is that, well, there's like a little dot that it's where the labials get connected on top. That's the most you can learn. And first of all, most of the time, there is so much shame around this area. You know, as you know, they call it the pudendal area, the area of shame, which is, I don't know why. Uh, there's so <laughs> Women much need shame more shame. <laughs> Something else oh. to feel bad about. <laughs> honestly, honestly. So. Okay, so, but there's actually a lot of misconceptions about it, how big it is, whether or not, you know, clitorises can have erections, things like that. So can you kind of fill us in because I saw that you're actually, you did the first ever uh, sonogram of the b- blood flow of the clitoris during orgasm. So you're like kind of an expert on this. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Of course. So, uh, you know, before, as you know, we just looked at clitoris and even not, we, really not men, not women, everybody. They are like, oh, so it's a little organ that's like a little tiny penis underneath the clitoral hood or however they explained it. But in reality, it goes much deeper. And when you see on the anatomy, what happens is really underneath both labia majora and it goes around the vagina, it kind of hugs the vagina and urethra. So it's a very big organ. And just like a penis that you can look at somebody's penis and be like, oh, what is this tiny little thing? But when it gets, you know, erected, it's much bigger. Same thing happens with the clitoris. Clitoris is filled with sinuses and just the whole thing has blood supply to it. So it becomes so much larger than even the actual anatomy and pictures that we have when it's engorged. And we see, I mean, even if you pay attention, any area that has erection, just like penis, they are very different looking when they are erected and Mm -hmm. they are not erected. Look at the nipple. When nipple is like, oh, you know, soft and not erected. And when it gets stimulated, it's like so perky. Same thing with the clitoris. And we can see this even in the outside portion of the clitoris, which we call it glands, you know, the head of clitoris. But it's in the whole clitoris and it goes all around the vagina. And believe it or not, just I call it, I mean, glands is the tip of clitoris, just like the tip of the penis. So the part that you see is just that little tip part of the penis that you see. That's the part that you see that's outside. And you actually don't see most of it because it's covered under a hood. So it's a much bigger organ is really, I say, this is tip of the iceberg. And there is so much goes into stimulating it with the angles you are doing. You know, since you talked about that, I actually have a very good partner. We are doing most of our research together. Uh, she's, she's a genius. So we did the first protocol for clitoral ultrasound together. And That's so cool. being, a, being a radiologist and being crazy just like me, you know, this is not a test that I can start. Oh, you know what? Let's just get Jackie and Jen and this patient and that patient <laughs> and just test it on them. She did it on herself. And we like literally had to be our 
you know, patient zero to show that there is actually a change and there is a huge change. And by the way, we're going to be published in sexology journal uh, next month for that and biomechanics of sex. There are lots of good things that are coming out. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. So you're a pioneer. So like fill me in, what are the newest treatment options for vaginal health and enhancing your orgasm and stuff like that? Because I feel like, you know, the old school of thinking was just when you got to menopause or whatever, like it was over for you. (laughs) Sorry, tap out. (laughs) And no, it's not. First of all, menopause is a very good chapter, by the way. I mean, not just talking about menopause. I think a lot of my patients who are in menopause, they are a lot better lovers to their partners than my 20, 25, 30 year old patients, because a lot of it comes with experience, you know, mm-hmm. you got to understand there are different levels to sex, whether it's intercourse, masturbation, all of those. One is getting to know your body. The other thing is that what's going in your brain, what's going on with your physiology. That's the only thing that menopause affects. And the other thing is that your experience is like you're driving a car, you know, somebody who has been on the road for 40 years. Most times they do much better than the guy who just got his driver's license. Mm-hmm. So I actually think when you help, especially with menopausal patients, when you help them with new treatments, which we're going to talk about, fortunately or unfortunately, they start getting in trouble. <laughs> Honestly, same thing is with guys. I, I, I've seen, there's actually an article that there is like, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia Mm. is on the rise in elderly population. (laughs) Why? Because now they're like, well, I'm getting great orgasms, whether it's a woman, man, I'm getting great erections. I'm actually getting orgasms. So they want to have sex more and more. And I mean, most of the time, the older guy can't keep up with them. So these are my patients in Miami that I have She's 65 years old, 70 sometimes. <laughs> the boyfriend is 25. And she's like, I don't know if he can keep up with me. I'm like, oh, great. Good for you. So <laughs> that's good medicine. So what do you have in your bag of tricks to offer these aging kind of clientele? For the aging clients, you got to try to turn back the time, basically kind of reverse the physiology. What are the things that you can do? The first thing you talk to people, they're all oh, hormone therapies. Mm-hmm. I like them. I do hormone therapies to some extent with bioidenticals, but I try to leave that as my last resort because they have a systemic effect. They mm-hmm. don't just go work on your vagina. They work on different parts of the body, which could be very good. You know, they could be really good for your heart health, for everything else. But I try to leave that for my last treatment. I try to start from localized treatments. And there are a few things that are really good with one. That's my favorite. And sometimes you have to combine them. The one is trying to make your tissue regenerate again. How do you do that? Because remember, we all start like a very nice, juicy plum everywhere in our body. And we end up becoming like a prune. Look, look at all these lines I have here. When I was younger, it used to be like this. Same thing happens with the vagina. Same thing happens to the neck, all of it. So we lose in collagen. So first you try to stimulate rebuilding your collagen, rebuilding your nerves, make the blood vessels healthier, all of those, which there is a very good modality I use called Cleovana. So what Cleovana machine does, it's actually an ultrasonic treatment. It's like sound waves. Mm -hmm. So kind of like when you do microneedling on your face and you basically poke tiny, tiny, tiny holes on your skin to bring the blood supply to your skin and try to repair it, regenerate, rebuild collagen. That's what you are doing. Cleovana does the same thing, but not with needles. You are trying to treat the entire clitoris Mm -hmm. with Cleovana and you're basically trying to hit every single vessel 
every nook and cranny of your clitoris, whether it's the outside part, inside part, to kind of stimulate it to start rebuilding new tissue, new vessels, and new nerves. Now, you got to use different modalities together. When I do, I do like some kind of a love treatment. And that's not just for patients of age, for everybody. Because orgasms, remember, they can always be better. Uh, It doesn't matter how old you are. It's funny, you know, I I have a patient, she comes for injections and sometimes Cleovana every single month. And she is around 32. She calls herself a sexaholic. She loves sex, um, but uh, <laughs> and she has a, she, she travels a lot. Very funny lady. I tell her, listen, this treatment you only need to do it every six months. So this is her answer to me. He's like, listen, can you ever be happy enough in your life? I'm like, I mean, I can, but she's like, no, no, no. You can always be happier. Can you ever have enough money in your life? So she says, orgasm is just like money. She's like, you made it so good the first time. I'm like, I want it to be even better. I get more injections, more Cleovana, it gets even better. So it just, it can't ever be good enough and you can make it better. And look, it's so important. Orgasms are one of the most crucial factors in our lives and people who don't have it and then they start having it. They it's feel a game such changer. A- yeah. They feel such change. They, they tell me, they're like, wow, you know what? I was depressed. I was this, I was that. And you know better than me. You know, you go to the gym, you exercise for a full hour and you feel so strong. You want to go back tomorrow. Mm-hmm. One orgasm gets you 30 times as much endorphins and encephalins, which are the morphines your body makes than going to the gym for that one hour. Totally. So everybody needs to get late, basically. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I did the treatment and it came at kind of an interesting time because I have just started recently treating, I have a thyroid hypothyroid issue and that was kind of affecting my libido. So at the same time, I'm, you know, taking a new medicine and kind of like getting that straightened out. I got the treatment. And so I think both of those things together really kind of like helped me get back on the really sexy path again and like feeling good about having How sex and stuff like that. How long ago? My last treatment was like two weeks ago, I think a week or two ago. Just give it some more time because. Oh what yeah. Happens, listen, you are stimulating the tissue. You are basically trying to destroy little parts in the tissue. So you bring your own blood supply, your own growth factors to that place. So they start rebuilding everything. So the maximum effects that you're going to see is going to be, I would say four to six weeks down the line, because now you have new nerves starting to build here, have new vessels starting to build there. I mean, listen, I have patients. I don't know if it's a good thing or bad thing. The, The last part of it, did you do it yourself or somebody else did the last part? kind of a mix (laughs) because no I have patients like that they they never even had an orgasm and then the last stage of it sometimes I'm like you know what I'm gonna walk outside the room I leave them with medical assistant they get an orgasm on the table and this is okay for somebody who gets orgasms regularly but somebody who hasn't have orgasm and I worked with a lot of them you know I treat uh the victims of uh female genital mutilation oh they actually cut their clitoris you know so i i know people who it's just in their mind impossible to get an orgasm and they've had even people like that have have had so we we, we did it we did it with one of their patients i'm actually doing a review of cleovana on these patients soon but I, i do other modalities too but it's very effective uh-huh. Just because you are not treating one part. Look, there are, there are things you can do. Even if you don't have the machine, you don't have anything. Somebody can, stim- you can stimulate yourself or uh, before intercourse, you can have your partner go down on you, all of these things to get clitoris more erected and get, you know, a better orgasm or try to get an orgasm. But you're only working on the tip part of the clitoris and the glands. But the good thing about Cleovana is that they, it does 
the entire cultural complex, the entire G zone, what we call it. And also for older patients, it makes the moisture of the vagina much better uh-huh. because it makes the skin around there healthier. Remember, this machine, the other modality it does, it fixes erectile dysfunction for men. Also, you can work on cellulite with it. So you see how labia majora around the vagina gets older and wrinkly. So it actually makes people say, oh my God, everything is much smoother. It even looks better. Interesting. Okay. So is there anyone who's like a prime candidate for it? Anyone who shouldn't get it? Of course. Look, so it's very safe because it's sound wave, a sound wave energy. So sound wave is like, not like ultrasound is similar, but in the same category, it's pretty safe. Of course, if you have any irritation around the area or you have a cut or something, I would defer it. I would do it later, but it's really for everyone. Mm. And depends on what angle you look at it. Somebody says, well, I'm 25 years old. I don't need it. And I tell them, listen, it's not about needing. This is something you want. You know, if, Mm -hmm. if you feel like, yes, for older patients, they may really need it. But if you're 25 and you want to go, you know, to the next level, you're going to feel your orgasms in the parts that you never felt them. Mm. You know, same thing, like my male patients, I tell them, start using a butt plug. They're like, why? I'm like, listen, your G-spot, the G-spot for men is in prostate. This is the anus. I'm like, have your girlfriend, boyfriend, whoever, put a finger in your anus, massage, you know, the middle part of prostate where all the nerves are coming. And at the same point, they can, you know, suck you or do something else. And they are like, wow. (laughs) <laughs> I never had such a feeling. So same thing. If you want to have a feeling you never had, I would tell you, try Cleovana. Even you want to do better than that, do the love treatment we are doing. Ask your doctor to do the Cleovana and at the same time, inject you with your own PRP. I inject the PRP around the clitoral mm-hmm. area and even in the vagina. That makes it even, you know, times stronger. Mm. I'm going to have to try that next time. Okay. So you also do work with uh, endometriosis patients, which I've known a lot of people who have struggled with that. And it is like a really awful, you know, condition to deal with. So what kind of work do you do with that in your practice? And it looks like there is, you have actually helped (laughs) relieve people of their pain. So how do you do that? So Endometriosis is like one of my biggest passions. So I, I, my practice, I stopped delivering babies six years ago. So my entire practice right now is endometriosis and cosmetic gynecology. And, you know, endo is a very nasty disease, but if you keep it at bay, you could live like a normal person. Mm-hmm. And, you know, everybody has like a magic bullet and they're, oh, you know, this is the way to do it. I think for endo, you have to approach the patient, the person from multiple channels, they do different things. I work a lot on their diets because diet is very important in endometriosis. So that's not, yes. Also CBD and a little bit of THC. If you use it locally in the vagina, behind the cervix. We, I had a big research on that and it really works. We actually help some patients get rid of the inflammation. So between the diet, that, the special massages, the lifestyle, the things that you have to do to try to eliminate it from growing anymore. But reality is that at some point, these patients need surgery. And then the surgery is very technical because there are so many doctors I know. And unfortunately, I mean, endo comes back, mm-hmm. but... And I get a lot of patients who have like recurrent endometriosis, even my own patients. But you should be, if you want to go to somebody for surgery, you should go to an endometriosis surgeon really to remove the lesions. You can't just go burn them a little bit or laser them because they're kind of like a tree or a bush of roses, let's say, that has a lot of roots. Mm -hmm. And even if you cut it or you burn it next year, it's going to start growing up again. So for endo, I think diet, lifestyle, 
CBDTSC and very important excision, excision, excision. You want to remove it. It needs to be excised completely. Mm. So like on the diet front, what kind of changes are you having patients make? So there are stuff that are really important to add because remember most diseases, including endometriosis, start from an inflammatory process, right? Inflammation is our enemy, really. Mm -hmm. You see, whether you have like a pimple on your face, that's inflammation, your gut problems, inflammation. So you want to decrease the inflammation. And how do you want to decrease it? By natural anti-inflammatory agents. What are those? Turmeric, really big, ginger, garlic, you know, bromelain. And they are good for your immune system, by the Mm -hmm. way, too. This is the same regimen I actually had during COVID. And I kind of stayed away from, you know, any COVID issues. I I got it probably twice, but I didn't even know I had it. We had somebody in the family who had, I'm like, oh, let me get tested. But I made sure I take my ginger every day and certain amount, turmeric, all of this, because you can't, listen, if you cook with those things and you can really have it every single day, it's amazing. So for endo, is the same thing. You want to have this diet that you decrease the inflammation. If you can go plant-based, I definitely would want you to go plant-based for at least six months. Even if you don't want to go completely plant-based, I want to get rid of dairy for a good six months in my Mm -hmm. end of patients. Dairy and gluten, you know, gluten is more difficult to get rid of than dairy. I start with dairy with them. And Look, I don't say be completely plant-based, be completely dairy-free. Actually, my partner in a business we are doing together, he's a plant-based chef and he doesn't even touch meat. So for me, I'm like, listen, I travel a lot. I see different people. Patients invite me to their houses. And I I wouldn't say, no, I'm not going to have the food that you cooked. But you just want to cut down on something. Mm -hmm. So you try to make as much as you can, even if it's a very small change. Aerobic exercise is very, very important. You know, so you want to get the blood moving in your body and all of those. Yoga, meditation, they are super, super helpful with endometriosis. And pelvic exercises. Pelvic exercises, if if it's a really bad endo, you can always go to get like pelvic therapy done. If not, just start with your kegels. Start with sex exercising, which is really important because I mean, sex is one of the best, you know, pelvic exercises, which people don't get it. And a lot of endo patients are scared of sex because you know what? You're having intercourse and you have all those endo lesions in the backside of your uterus. So everything is painful. I'm like, listen, just change the position. Don't go too deep because most of the time is with, you're really trying to get more relaxed and whether you have to do that with like some CBD, THC before that to get your body relaxed and get the muscles relaxed. Okay. So, and then one other thing that kind of blew my mind a little that I saw on your Instagram was that people get skin cancer near their vagina, which the, I'm not checking there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's possible. Listen, the skin cancer is, you know, it's the most, most common cancer. And uh, the reason is not the most common killer is most of the time you picking it up really early. You have a little mold somewhere and your dermatologist just removes it and it doesn't ever get to that stage. But there could be around the vagina, labias, all of us. So you have to, especially these days, it's much easier because the grooming has changed so much. I remember when I went to medical school, everybody had a big bush and then it started transforming. (laughs) It became that landing strip and then uh, ended up becoming nothing. So, (laughs) you know, you can see the whole area, have either yourself, your partner, just check it out. Even around the anus, I actually picked up a case of melanoma right outside the anus on the butt cheek. And in the area that is closed, it's between the cheeks. So you wouldn't see unless you pay attention. And look, you can have moles there for many, many years and it's nothing. But if there is something new 
if it's something, discoloration that's changing in size, changing in color, starting to have a different pattern, starts bleeding, all of those are bad signs that you need to get it checked. Okay. Amazing. This is such good information. I have one more question for you. So like from what you see in your practice for vagina havers to maintain their sexual wellness, can you kind of walk me through like what young women should be doing, what middle age or, you know, 40 ish women should be doing. And then what like postmenopausal women should be doing. Well, I mean, first of all, you need to have your annual exams regularly for everyone. I feel because uh, especially if you are not sexually active, because you want somebody to look at the area, check everything. Now, the reason I say that, especially as, you know, our biggest problem is usually problems with cervix for women. So cervical can, and that's why you're getting your pap smears regularly. Now, when you are sexually active, if there is a lesion building up on the cervix, you would know much earlier. Because with any kind of intercourse, whether it's a toy or a penis, whatever it is, it's going to irritate that lesion and you're going to start getting bleeding. So you would go to a doctor. Mm -hmm. For people who are not sexually active, many times, I mean, a lot of times, you find out when this lesion is like so huge on the cervix and then it starts breaking down. So they come to me, they're like, oh, I have this bleeding for started like bleeding and they're like this. It's nasty tissue coming out. And I find out that, oh, they haven't been sexually active for the past 10 years. You know, it's like a room that you haven't gone in or a house that mm -hmm. you left it somewhere. You go, anything can be inside it. You put the speculum and it could be very scary. So make sure you see your doctor once a year. That's really important, especially to check your cervix. And then for the health of the vagina, remember pH of the vagina for every single age, it's very important. I would not put any soaps around the vagina. I always tell my patients it's a self-cleansing organ. It cleans itself. Water, when you shower, no douching. None of those things is necessary. Of course, if you have an infection, you want to see your doctor, you want to make sure your pH is balanced and take care of it. And the infections in the vagina mostly, you either see yeast infections that you see those little white pieces, you know, mm -hmm. they call it potted cheese or that grayish discharge that smells like fish. That's going to be bacterial vaginosis. Most women know. And treating it is really easy. Most of the time I say, give it five, six days. A lot of times your body takes care of it. And a lot of times these problems happen because you somehow disrupted that pH balance. Whether you went to that hot tub or whether you... I don't know, had an antibiotic because you had a cold, something happened that you disrupted that, or you put something like some kind of scented cream mm -hmm. or something around there. Any of those, of course, or like a loop that you didn't know, any of those, of course, could cause this problem. Again, for every woman, any age, I think using condom, if you're having sex with an opposite sex partner, it's good, good sex idea. practice, yeah. a good idea. Most people don't like to do it. I mean, but, you know, unless you really know the partner and you have to really know them, I, I would definitely do that. One of the best lubricants, it's really coconut oil. Really? Natural, organic coconut oil. Now, that's the problem, I tell you. Organic coconut oil that you would put in your mouth. So it doesn't have any pesticides, anything. But remember, that's an oil. It doesn't go well with condoms. It's going to break your condom. You may get STDs. So this is only for people who've been in a relationship forever. They trust their partners and they are not using condoms. If you want to use condoms, you can't use coconut oil. But coconut oil is really good for that area because it's an anti-candida. It actually prevents yeast infection. Now, I don't want you to go put like a lot of coconut oil, you know, on the area because sometimes I tell patients and that causes more problem. No, but if, you know, you want to keep even the labia majora, the skin around it, you want to keep it moist, I would put like a drop of coconut oil and it goes a long way. 
And it's actually very good when you're taking a shower, if you have that in your shower, you just put like a drop and kind of massage it in the area outside. So it kind of locks the moisture in and all of those. So that could be something very helpful too. Oh, and then just when, at what point, I know you're like, listen, you can always make it better, but at what point do you see people really where they should think about these other treatments to like really enhance their sex life? Uh, you know what, when they realize that they really want to, first of all, if you feel any dryness or if you feel like you, you're not enjoying sex as much as you want to enjoy it. And if you want to connect your clitoris really to your brain, that's how I explain it to my patients because look, clitoris is just an organ, mm -hmm. just like penis, but a lot of stimulation, orgasm, and all of that starts from the brain. Mm. In women, I say 95% of it starts from the brain. 95% of orgasm happens in the brain. In men, probably 5% of it happens in the brain. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I think these are very good modalities that reconnect your clitoris to your brain. And, you know, I don't call it a treatment even. I call it somehow like self-care. You know, we care about our skin to look nice. We make sure I put lotion on it. You take care of your hair, you groom it, you... You know, if you need glasses, you go get glasses. This is the same thing. You take care of a very important organ. You make it happy. Just like when you make your nails happy, you feel so much happier yourself. So this is the same thing. You make the clitoris happy. Then you're walking out of there. You are Skipping. in a party. <laughs> exactly. You feel like, you know what? I, I actually, I want to have sex. It's just instead of your brain telling you, your clitoris needs to tell you, you know what? I I gotta have sex. I mean, I don't know if you read this, like such balls Erica Jong had, uh, fear of flying. 40 years ago, she talks about zipless fuck, that women need to be like men, you know, so you can start thinking with your clitoris. And I mean, not in a bad way, it's a huge empowerment, you know, because I see my patients, not just with Cleovana, when they get these treatments, you know, Cleovana injections. They're like, you know what? I feel like a different person. Because mm -hmm. it's an important part of our life and we don't pay attention to it. I'm glad there are people like you that you have a podcast dedicated to this. There's so much taboo around it. You know, when I wanted to do, I did the first designer Regina fashion show in New York six, seven years ago. Everybody was laughing at me. They're, you're crazy. You're going to lose your license to practice medicine. You're, I'm like, listen, I'm not doing this to get people naked and nobody is coming naked. That's the name. We're getting some press around it. This is to really empower women and talk about things that we don't talk about. And it's very important because when you are happy, when you are happy with your sex life, when you're actually enjoying and you get those endorphins and all those hormones in your body, you're going to be much more productive at your work. You're going to care about everything else about your family everything is going to be completely different. When you have that, and that's kind of blocked, same thing that Freud said happened. Everything is going to be immature in your life. But he said it the other way, you know, and he set us back by 100 years. Oh, full circle. You are a master. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything else you think I should know or listeners should know? Well, I think you know everything, but uh, um, th th thank you so much for really doing this and bringing different. I, I looked at a couple of your podcasts too. The fact that you bring different people from different angles and you talk about such an important issue, which, you know, we don't talk about it in our community. It, that That's very important. That's very important. And thank you. <laughs>